Hallelujah. And so today, we continue to tackle the words of our risen Savior in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to look at Matthew 6, 25 through 30. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this passage. I pray that you would speak through me today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? You know, I, I honestly, um, as a kid, would be scared of this idea that there's a ravenous beast out there ready for me, right? My mom used to scare me about with, the, with this idea that there's a wolf. I mean, we were living in the middle of the trailer park. There was all kinds of things running around in the trailer park. And yet my mom would say, there's a wolf out there, right, to keep me in line. But it is, the big bad wolf is one of those things you find throughout literature, right? Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs, Peter and the Wolf. Wolf, the boy who cried wolf, right? Even Jesus said something about wolves. He said, hey, watch out in this sermon that we've been studying, the Sermon on Mount. Watch out for false teachers because they come like wolves in sheep's clothing in Matthew 7, 15. Why is it so scary? Why is it so scary? Because they come out of the darkness. They're untamable. They're ravenous. And oftentimes, if you see one, you know they're in a pack. Right? And there is a big bad wolf that I believe every one of us deals with. Every single one of us. I believe there's a big bad wolf that whether you're, you're a, a young guy or an old guy, right? Whether you're a young woman or an old woman or in between, right? I, I think that there is a big bad wolf that each one of us deals with that comes up out of the darkness and just bites us sometimes. And that is the big bad wolf of worry. Worry is a problem. There are so many things that could happen. I get notifications on my phone. I, I, I watch something on TV. I, I see these things. Uh, something ha I get news about my parents. Uh, I get news about this thing in my family. And worry becomes a problem. I mean, look at it. We can worry, right? Somebody said, well, you know, they look at young men and they say, well, hey, when I was your age, I owned my own home. I did that. And then you think back, like, well, when I was your age, when, if I was your age, and back then, a house costs a quarter of what it costs today. Yeah. Right? We worry about the price of houses and colleges and groceries. We worry about what kind of uh, world this is going to be that our kids are going to grow up in. We're worried about our aging parents. Are they going to be okay? We worry about the time that we have. And what I want, listen, I want to get involved in church, but I worry I'm not going to have enough time for me. Right? We worry about, is our country headed into to things we never would imagine in our lifetime? And Jesus spoke these words that we're going to read today to the big bad wolves in our lives. He spoke them to even people who had worries back then. I mean, you think about it, the, the audience he was speaking to, right? The, these Jewish people, they were God's people in God's promised land, and they had the Romans over top of them, pressing down on them, right? God, what, I'm worried about this. When are you going to do something? They worried, they were in an agricultural society, so, so they worried, not about getting a job, but is their land going to produce enough this year? And are they going to have extra seed for next year? Are they going to be able to take care of their necessities? Are they going to be able to feed their animals? And then on top of that, are they going to have enough money to pay these stinking Romans? Right? And, honestly, at that point in history, war after war after war, called the Maccabean Wars, had been happening in Jewish history. And they're asking themselves, is our leaders going to take us into another war? How many of you have the same concern after the news from last night about Israel being attacked, right? Yeah. Jesus looks at us and says, human condition has not changed. And so what he said 2,000 years ago applies to today. And so what does Jesus do? He gives us a command. He gives us four considerations. And then he gives us a challenge. So let's read it. Matthew 6, verse 25. It says, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. I've got to tell you, in the Greek, this is emphatic. Right? Remember the Bible was originally written in Greek and then it was translated to English? This is not a suggestion. 
This is not like, hey, I just hope that you hear me, that you don't have to worry. No, this is a forceful command, an impa a strong imperative. It is not some glib suggestion. It is something that says, don't worry, right? So what does he mean by worry? What does he mean talking about? I think, I don't even know if I have to define it for you because we know that worry is letting our anxiety lead us to preoccupation. Right? Worry, worries, we, we put things in our mind, we worry about something, and then the stuff that doesn't even happen, we think, oh, I'm so anxious about that. In fact, our word for worry in the English actually comes from to choke or to strangle. How many of us think that sometimes when our worry grabs hold of us, it's somebody choking us, right? Yes. Worry is letting things choke the faith out of you. Look, I also tell you that this is a command, but Jesus is not saying do not be concerned. He's not saying have your head up in the sky, okay? He said don't worry. So what's the difference between a worry and a concern? I remember one farmer told me that worry is getting all worked up over a bunch of stuff that you ain't got no control over no how. Right? And worry and concern are different though. Worry is about, I've got to fix this. Concern is, got to work it out, but I'll keep my attention on it. Worry is, this thing is draining me and stopping me from moving forward. I can't do anything about it. I don't know what to do. I'm anxious. Concern is, I'm going to go to God in prayer and I'm going to work hard and let God take care of the rest. I mean, Jesus told us don't worry. Why? Because worry doesn't make your job easier. It doesn't work out your finances. It doesn't make your relationship smoother. It doesn't make you look better. And then guess what? It doesn't even make you smile more. And how many of you know we need to smile more, right? Right? It doesn't increase your contentment. It doesn't make you more fun to be around. How many of you uh, uh, know that there's some people that, man, you know, they, they're a worry work and they are not fun. Every time you're around them, all they do is complain about this thing could happen to them and this thing is going to happen to them. And you're like, Lord, please give me the strength to deal with them. Okay? <laughs> See, when you ask who cares, I think Jesus is saying worry says no one. Concern says God does. So be concerned about your cholesterol or weight. Be concerned about your child's behavior in school. Be concerned about your credit card debt and, and how it's getting unmanageable. Be concerned about your mental health. Be concerned about the things you face in illness. Be concerned about your family. But don't worry. If there's something you can't control, God's got it. So how do we do this? Well, Jesus doesn't leave us hanging, does he? What Jesus does is he gives us four things to look at. He says, here's, here's the command. Don't worry. So let's keep reading. Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. Verse 25. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. And then keeps going on and going on, right? And he gives us, actually Jesus gives us four different considerations to help challenge us not to worry. And I think, I put a little images on the screen because I, I think well, these four considerations are really important. The first one that he tells us about is food and clothing. We need a mind shift, Jesus says. If you're not going to worry, you need to shift your mind thinking is, how am I going to make it, right? That's how we think. How am I going to make it to, my life is worth more to God. Look at the food and clothing. I think Jesus here in, in this passage in verse 25, he's using this rabbinical uh, technique to shift our mind. He points us to something little and says, listen, if that's little and God takes care of that, all you need to do is realize he's going to take care of the big. If he takes care of the little, why wouldn't he take care of the big? We have anxiety about food and clothing today, right? The prices keep going up. So we look at it and we say, Lord, help me. But i got to tell you Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a person's heart weighs it down, but a good word cheers it up. So here's the good word. What did he say in verse 25? He said, look, you worry about prices and all these things, right? Verse 25, he says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. 
Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? He gets you to look at this big thing called life and this big thing called your body. And guess who created that? God created your life and your body, right? That's huge. He spoke it into existence. He had a plan for you. And Jesus is pointing this back to that and says, if He created you for this moment, gave you that life, gave you that body, why are you worried about something so small like food and clothing? Why let the prices that keep rising up grab hold of your heart? I heard one person say, and I think this is wise, it's not so much what you eat that kills you, it's rather, it's what eats at you. You know, okay, Jesus says, don't worry about food and clothing. Okay, Mr. Preacher. Okay, Jesus. Okay, okay. What about these famines and fires and floods that happen? What about people who are starving? I mean, isn't the whole point of the reason that, that people are attacking Israel today is because there was whole people starving? What about those people? Doesn't God, Where's God in all that? What about the people lacking clothing? What about the people who lack basics like water, food, and a clean place to live? I, I got to tell you, it is honestly astounding that we in America have that kind of point of view. Did you know that if just the Christians got together around the globe, that we could solve that problem, those problems, within six months? There's enough money sitting in the pockets of everybody who claims to be a Christ. Uh, extra money. I'm not even talking about hurting you. Extra money to solve those problems in a year. But we don't. So I'm sitting here thinking, you might say, well, where's God? Maybe God's saying, where are you? Hebrews 13.5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I'm never going to leave you nor abandon you. In other words, I have to have a mind shift. How am I going to make it to, oh yeah, I'm valuable to God. And i got to keep focus on that. Second thing, that the second, this concentration that he wants to give us is not just food and clothes, but he also says, look at the birds. Look at verse 26. He says, consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Once again, Jesus is taking that something that's so small and applying it to the big, right? He's taking something, something that, that's out there and says, Hey, don't you understand? Why are you, is worry gripping your heart if I'm going to take care of these birds? Birds are annoying sometimes. They're beautiful, right? I mean, who doesn't love the, the beauty of, of a Cardinals? And I'm not talking baseball, okay? Y'all Cardinal fans out there, all right, whatever, okay? I'm just talking, go Baltimore, right? I'm talking about, I'm talking about this, this, that God, basically God takes care of these beautiful things. I mean, it's wonderful to see this, this red Cardinal come by or, or a, 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 a beautiful eagle fly in the sky. I mean, God feeds them. And you're worth more than birds, you understand that? If he cares about something so small, won't he also care for you? So why would I let worry grip my heart? I mean, think about it. Birds actually eat three to four times their weight to make it every day. Whew. I'm trying to eat three to four times with it, with my weight, but it's hard, I'm telling you, right? But God provides the food for them. That much. Jesus is also not saying that birds don't work. It just says that they don't sow and reap like we do and gather into barns, right? The birds actually have a lot of work to do. They have to uh, protect their, their, their lives from, from predators. They have to collect food for their young. They have to build nests. They have to fight off bigger birds. But you don't see birds worrying. You don't. Because... They know that God, well, they don't even know that. They're knuckleheads. They're bird-brained. But they have an innate sense that there's something taking care of them. And that is God. See, you can look at this passage and you can say, well, see, Jesus doesn't want us to worry about things, about clothes and food. And that means that Christians really don't, shouldn't focus on working. i got to tell you, some even taught that in the early church. 
They actually said that since Jesus is going to take care of everything and he's coming back soon anyway within our lifetime, that was 2,000 years ago, if, if I, we just trust, if we really trusted God, we would quit our jobs and sell everything and just live off of that. And here's what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 11. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They're not busy, but busy bodies. Jesus comes along and says, listen, birds work, but they don't worry. I mean, think about it. There's that song, if his eyes on the sparrow, and I'll save you from having to sing it, right? But the, the fact is, is that his eye, if it's on the sparrow, you don't think that God doesn't know the number of hairs on your head? I mean, think about it. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Hmm. That should give you comfort. There was a, a father who uh, took his little girl home from school, from uh, school in Sunday school, um, and asked her, "Hey, hey, what did you learn today in kids' church? Right? What did you learn today?" And um, the little girl said to, to dad, "Dad, guess what? We learned all about blankets. We learned everything about blankets. How it was really cool." And uh, dad went to the back of his Bible and looked up the word blankets and couldn't find it in the index. It was like, what is this little girl? What is she saying? And so, she w so he was like, pulled the teacher aside the next week when he showed up to church. She says, hey, um, I don't understand this. How was kids church last week? Was there a Bible lesson or were you teaching quilting or something? <laughs> and the teacher said, no, it was great, but we taught that God is a comforter. God is a comforter. He comforts the birds. He's going to comfort you. Then Jesus gives us another mind shift, right? He gives us another mind shift. He says, I, I know that worry leads you to say things like, I, I can't handle it if this happens. If I lose a loved one, I can't handle it. If I... Uh, financial crisis happens. I can't handle it. I mean, I'm tempted right now to say, my son is of age. If we go to war, he could be drafted in two, three years. I, I, how am I going to handle that? Right? I, I don't want him. To, I want him. I, I don't. Yeah. Right? I'm, this, is, this could be my worry. And God is calling me to look at that and, and, and to hear Jesus' words, don't worry. To say, I, I don't know if I can handle it if to God will give me the strength when the time comes. Amen. Yes. Look at verse 27. It's almost like he throw, Jesus throws us in there. Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? Actually, this is a trans in the translation. It actually means, can any of you add the length of your forearm to your stature? Okay, that, that's actually literally what the text says in the Greek. But I don't think Jesus was talking about, you know, increasing your stature. I think, I think what he's talking about was something else. I think he was talking about what this, what this translation says about time. Because Psalm 39.5 says, in fact, you have made my days just inches long. It is, it is a usual thing to talk about measurements and time. And Jesus is sitting here talking about, listen, I want you to look at time. Can any of you do anything about it? I mean, we need to face the fact that actually worry shortens our life. Here's some health benefits of worry. Acid reflux, chest pains, panic attacks, mental meltdowns, ulcers, sleeping problems, high blood pressure. Half of the deaths in the U.S. are caused by worrying lifestyles. Do you know what the most common sign of heart disease is? Sudden death. People just dropping over because of their worry, right? And you don't even know it because we wear our worry well until they die. 
I mean, don't you think it's humorous how rich people, they, I mean, they go through great lengths, right? Um, uh, you know, maybe if I was rich, I wouldn't be making fun of rich people, but I am today. I, I'm going to make fun of rich people, right? And so uh, that rich people, what do they do? They, they go to great lengths to try to lengthen their lives, to add time to their lifespan, right? I mean, there's a company that if you just pay them $80,000, they'll chop off your head and freeze it until, until you can get better, right? We heard at Disney somewhere, had hired, uh, Walt Disney hired a company to put his head in a cryo chamber. But you, that ain't none of that going to work. None of that's going to work. If we can't add time to our lifespan by worry or anything else, what do we do then? Well, Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. I really do believe what we need to do is realize that, that God will not allow you to be shaken. In other words, that no matter when you come up to a situation and you think, I'm not going to make it, you start to trust God and cast that burden on Him, and you say, when the time comes, God will give me the strength. You might not have the strength right now to deal with a tragic loss that's down in your future. But when the time comes, God will give you the strength then. There are some things that you, you can't imagine, right? Max Lucado in his book, Traveling Light, says that Christians need to be people who learn regularly when the time comes is a phrase they need to grab onto. What happens if my husband gets sick? I don't know. When the time comes, God will give it to me. What will happen when my kids leave the house? I don't think I can handle that. When the time comes, God will do it. How am I going to be a good dad or a mom when this baby comes out? When the time comes, God will put you through it. What if my retirement doesn't work out? When the time comes, God will do it. Am I going to be able to handle this teenager in my house who used to be my loving baby boy and he's changed so much? When the time comes, God will give me the strength, the hope, the love, the joy, or whatever is needed when the time comes. Sometimes Jesus doesn't give it to you until you need it. So in Psalm 50, 55, 22, I cast my burdens on the Lord and He will sustain me and He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. So he says, look at food and clothing. He said, look at birds, look at time. And then he says, I want you to look at the flowers of the field. I want you to go from stop worrying about how other people see you, because that's really a cause for worry for a lot today, and start considering how God sees you. Look what he says about flowers. Verse 28 through 29. Why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. I mean, he, he goes to us and he says, listen, you got to look at who the Jewish people in the first century thought was the stuff. Right? He uses Solomon, King Solomon, the son of David, the one who was the richest king ever in their land. Right? Solomon was the richest, and he was the best looking, and he, had, he was known to have beautiful clothes. He had a strut about him. How do I know that? Because he wound up with 800 wives. Right? you got to have something about you to come up with that many women. Right? Solomon was, was, was uh, a... a not, I'm not saying that was a good thing. Okay? Okay, I'm sorry. All right? I'm just saying that there was something about Solomon that made him beautiful. Right? In fact, it even says in, in 1 Kings 10 that the Queen of Sheba, the, the icon of beauty in ancient literature, came and sought out Solomon. He didn't have to go to her. She came to him. Right? Solomon was so wealthy that people would come to see him. And Jesus says, they ain't got nothing on field flowers. <laughs> Solomon could afford any fashion. But the field flowers of Israel are better dressed. In fact, I got a picture of current day, 2023, so it last year, uh, some field flowers from Israel. Right? This is in Galilee. This is a, a photo from um, a, a company, Islet Bar Mar. Um, look how beautiful they are. Right? Just wonderful in, in, in Israel. And what Jesus is saying to us is look at them. You think you're worth less than that? Why are you worried about your clothes? 
I mean, Solomon, who was the first century Harry Styles in fashion, right? Those, that probably illustration just probably went over a lot of people's heads. If you don't know who Harry Styles is, okay, he's like the Clark Gable or maybe the Elvis or the James Dean of today, okay? He's dressed to impress, all right? And if you don't know who those three are, he was a guy who really had a lot of, he's a guy who has a lot of fashion, all right? And the flowers are more beautiful than Harry Styles. Elvis, James Dean, Clark Gable, these flowers. So if the flowers are beautiful, who are you trying to dress to impress? I mean, think about it. You are the apple of God's eye. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His possession, so that you can proclaim the praises of the One who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's who you are. You are wonderful to God. And we're worried about our clothing. They say clothing makes the man, right? And clothing actually is a way to find acceptance, I think. There's a whole $1.7 trillion industry of people who think clothing makes the man. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 my love makes the man. Jesus is not just talking about the basic needs of clothing, but he's also talking about letting other people control your thoughts. Are you caught up in that? I mean, look at the flowers. They don't care, and they're beautiful. Don't you realize how beautiful you are? I, recently, um, I read a report about uh, some missionaries who were in Africa. And I'd rather not, they, they weren't Assemblies of God missionaries, and so I'm not going to um, say, oh, those bad other ones, right? I'm just, these were people who gave their lives to preach the gospel in Africa, okay? And they went and began to offer medicine and to heal people and to build wells and, and do all those things. Um, but they were faced with some things they've never seen before. They, they were faced with uh, some demonic activities, um, some uh, witchcraft and, and dark practices that they had never seen. And um, what they realized, um, that they would lose support from back home if they became charismatic and started dealing with these demons. They started dealing with these things and saying, in the name of Jesus, be gone and cast out demons and heal people, right? So, so they wanted to offer these people good stuff. But they were so worried about what back home would say that they wound up offering no experience on the spiritual. So what did the locals do? They'd take their medicine and then go to the witch doctor and sell it to them. And I was thinking, man, what a missed opportunity to take the power of God, the love of God, along with being the hands and feet of Jesus. Yes. And they were worried about losing their support back home because us American churches wouldn't support them if they became too charismatic and too crazy out there. And I look at this and I think, look at the flowers of the field. Don't you realize how precious you are? Why are you worried about what other people think? Look what he does. Jesus has given us his command. Don't worry. He said, listen, I, I don't want you to worry. And I want you to, I'm giving you four things to look at, right? Food and clothing, birds, time, and flowers. And then he wraps this little part up with this challenging question. And it cuts to our heart. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow. Won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? Won't he do it? The challenge here is not just to look at the nice pictures Jesus paints. The challenge here is to follow the command of don't worry because I'm giving you a reason to obey it. Your life is valuable to your Father in Heaven. These flowers, this grass, these fields that are beautiful. I mean, we know that a scorching east wind would come in and wipe them out and scorch them up. We also know that they would be bundled up and thrown in and used for fuel in the, in, in the people's homes. But Jesus is saying, if the fire is coming from the outside, or if it's even coming from your home, you don't need to worry about it. 
Because God has you on His mind. You're worth more than the flowers. You're worth more than, than time management. You're worth more than birds. You're worth more than clothes and food. You're worth more than you can imagine. I mean, I know life is hard. And I know the future is so uncertain. And we realize we're not in control. I mean, we even let the media speak into our lives more than God's Word. We need something to hold on to. In World War II, the death of many adults left many orphans. And the Allies went in and said, what are we going to do with all these kids that are running around? And so they would build um, these places, that, these orphanages, to, to, in order to relocate the kids so they can take care of these people who were lost. And, and they would provide food, and they would provide shelter, and they would provide the cleanest of water. But in one orphanage, it kind of perplexed them. Because all the other, other orphanages were okay, but in this one orphanage... Man, they got three good meals, they got to sleep at night, nobody was bothering them, but the kids couldn't sleep. In fact, they brought in doctors to help them at the orphanage. Well, why these kids couldn't sleep? And the doctor scratched her head, they couldn't find anything health-wise, they, they were worried about these little kids, about why they couldn't they sleep. And one doctor said, hey, why don't you try this? As they're about to go to sleep, give each kid a piece of bread. Just give them a piece of bread. So they tried it. That's weird. A piece of bread. I thought you were going to try medicine or, you know, give them some melatonin. Get, do something, right? No, give them a piece of bread. And uh, the next day, they reported that all the kids had fallen asleep. Why? Because even though they were in the orphanage and were well fed and taken care of, they saw their parents die in front of them. And they had nothing to hold on to to remind them that tomorrow they're still going to be fed. But by giving them a piece of bread at night, and the bread tucked right into their little hands as they slept, they knew that at least in the morning they could wake up and have a piece of bread for breakfast. And it gave them peace. Some of us don't follow the command of do not worry. Because the bread that God has given us, the Word of God, is not in our hands. So we wake up and we're fraught. We can't sleep. And let me tell you one little piece of bread that maybe you could hold on to. Philippians 4.19 And my God will supply all your needs according to those riches in glory in Jesus Christ. And my God, Philippians 4.19, will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Jesus Christ. Amen. The little piece of bread, you need to get a scripture and you need to hold on to it if you're a worry wart. So that you can blossom into something wonderful that God wants for you. And you need to grab hold of that scripture because God will provide because you're valuable enough. Valuable enough to pursue. Valuable enough to die for. He went to the cross. He's valuable. You are valuable enough to raise from the dead for. He defeated your greatest enemy, death. You're valuable enough to clean up. He said, well, I'm not just going to go through this religious thing. I'm just going to take your whole heart and wash it up so that you're new again. You're valuable enough to adopt. You're valuable enough to live in. And you're valuable enough to change the world through. So here's the challenge. If God clothes the grass, yet it has such a fate of being burnt up, will I trust God? I mean, I really need to ask, do I think God's big enough to do it? But do I also believe God loves me enough to do it? Yeah. I think a lot of people can answer that first question, but that second question, they have a lot of doubt. So grab that bread. Grab that bread. Philippians 4.19 And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Let God speak into your worries. I mean, these big bad wolves come up out of, out of, the, out of the dark, right? And I don't even know what tomorrow is going to hold and which country is going to add on to a war that might be brewing. I don't know where our country is going and how the election is going to happen. I don't know how all these things are going to happen. But I do know these big bad wolves are already defeated. Yeah. 
Amen. Sin, worry, despair, death, grief, and pain is gone. Jesus came and put their wolves in their place. He defeated them all and even defeated the baddest wolf himself, Satan. Satan had the world in his hands, right? He's called the ruler of this world. He's called the God of the ages, right? And yet, yet Jesus came and let Satan throw all the weapons at him. Sin of the world. Jesus carried it. Penalty of death. Jesus defeated it. Took all the sin at the cross. Rose up from the dead in the empty tomb, right? And he went into this darkness. Went down for three days in the darkness and killed the wolf down there. Amen. So here's how you defeat worry. And here's how you live a worry-free life. You trust the wolf killer. Lord, help us to trust the wolf killer. Help us to follow after you. Because there's some things, Lord, that we need healing. And there's healing in this house. And as the band comes forward, and as we're about to sing, help us to realize how precious our life is to you. Because that is the answer to deal with worry. You've defeated the wolf. So, uh, Lord... Help us in the name of Jesus to crush Satan underneath our feet. Yes. Just like Romans 16, 19 says. And the God of peace which passes all understanding will guard our hearts. Thank you, God. Bring healing into this house. In the name of Christ. Amen. Now as this...